Okay, <clears throat> this is uh, stoichiometry. Stoichiometry, there's a little bit of a conflict between the way the book performs the problems and the way I perform the problems. The book uses dimensional analysis, uh, unit label conversions, etc. And I simply set up proportional relationships in order to solve the problem. I take my time solving the problems, which is what you should do, not doing it all in one step. Silk is one of the most beautiful and luxurious of all fabrics. It is spun from the cocoons of silkworms. Silk manufacturers know from experience that to produce enough silk to make just one elegant Japanese kimono, they will need over 3,000 cocoons. In a similar fashion, chemists need to know how much reactant is needed to make a certain amount of product. The answer lies in chemical equations. From a balanced chemical equation, called a stoichiometric equation, you can determine the quantities of reactants and products in a reactant. Or, given two of three, you can calculate the third. It's very easy to do once you know the concept of the mole. Here are pictures of the cocoons in the lower right to lower left is the material, to the upper left is the kimono. Here is the, uh, the insect that uh, is produced by the cocoon, and then you have the cocoon here, and these are, <coughs> uh, you need 3,000 of these to make one elegant kimono, unbelievable. Silk-based surgical implants could offer a better way to repair broken bones. When a person suffers a broken bone, treatment calls for the surgeon to insert screws and plates to help bond the broken section and enable the fracture to heal. These fixation devices are usually made of metal alloys, light metal alloys, such as titanium. But metal devices may have disadvantages. Because they are stiff and unyielding, they can cause stress to underlying bone. They also pose an increased risk of infection and poor wound healing. In some cases, the metal implants must be removed following fracture healing, necessitating a second surgery. Resorbable fixation devices made of synthetic polymers avoid some of these problems but may pose a risk of inflama inflammatory reactions and are difficult to implant. Now, using pure silk protein derived from silkworm cocoons, a team of investigators from Tufts University School of Engineering and Beth Israel's Deaconess Medical Center, BIDMC, has developed surgical plates and screws that may not only offer improved bone remodeling following injury, but importantly, can also be absorbed by the body over time, eliminating the need for surgical removal of the devices. The findings demonstrated in vitro and in a rodent model are described in the March 4th issue of Nature Communications. Unlike metal, the composition of silk protein may be similar to bone composition, says co-senior author Dr. Samuel Lin of the Division of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery at BIDMC, an associate professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School. Silk materials are extremely robust. They maintain structural stability under very high temperatures and withstand other extreme conditions and they can be readily sterilized. Collaborating with Lynn were co-senior author and Tufts Chair of Biomedical Engineering, Dr. David Kaplan, a leader in the use of silk for biomedical applications, and a team of biomedical and mechanical engineers. One of the other big advantages of silk is that it can be it can stabilize and deliver bioactive components so that plates and screws made of silk 
could actually deliver antibiotics to prevent infection, pharmaceuticals to enhance bone regrowth, and other therapeutics to support healing, says Kaplan. All from Silk. Kaplan and his team have previously developed silk-based sponges, fibers, and foams for use in the operating room and in clinical settings. But until now, silk hadn't been used in the development of a solid medical device for fracture fixation. The Tufts researchers used silk protein obtained from Bombyx mori, B. mori, silkworm cocoons to form the surgical plates and screws. Produced from the gland of the silkworm, the silk protein is folded in complex ways that gave it unique properties of both exceptional strength and versatility. To test the new devices, the investigators implanted a total of 28 silk base screws in six laboratory rats. Insertion of screws was straightforward and assessments were then conducted at four weeks and eight weeks post-implementation. No screws failed during implementation, says Kaplan, explaining that because silk is slow to swell and new devices maintained their mechanical integrity even when coming into contact with fluids and surrounding tissues during surgery. The outcome suggests that the use of silk plates and screws can spare patients the complications of removal of metal devices or potential inflammatory hydrolytic products from synthetic polyesters. Having a resorbable, long-lasting plate and screw system has potentially huge applications, says Lynn, while the initial aim is to use silk-based screws to treat facial injuries, which occur at a rate of several hundred thousand each year, the devices have the potential for the treatment of a variety of different types of bone fractures. Just guessing down by the ankle where there's a lot of bone to skin and not much tissue there would probably be very helpful. Because the silk screws are inherently radiolucent, not seen on x-rays, it may be easier for surgeon to see how the fracture is progressing during the post-op period without the impediment of metal devices, says Lynn. And having an effective, effective system in which screws and plates melt away once the fracture is healed may be of enormous benefit we're extremely excited to continue this work in larger animal models and ultimately in human clinical trials. When you break cookies, we're back to using everyday equations, we're out of silk right now. When you bake cookies, you probably use a recipe. A cookie recipe tells you the precise amount of ingredients to mix to make a certain number of cookies, as shown in figure one, approximately the next slide. If you need a larger number of cookies than the recipe provides, you can double or triple the amounts of ingredients. Figure one, a cookie recipe, tells you the number of cookies that you can expect to make from the listed amounts of ingredients using models. How can you express a cookie recipe as a balanced equation? Remind me around the holidays uh, that you can make cookies for extra credit if you show me the recipe prior to that. Just remind me. So here are some recipes for cookies. And um, they are uh, specific. They are well practiced. And it's very similar to doing a lab in the laboratory using chemicals and equations. It's the same thing. There's no difference. You're just doing things that uh, more, I don't know, atomic, molecular, chemistry level. You're using moles, etc. But you're still using quantities, and you still have to follow instructions. So I'm not sure there's much of a difference in many ways from making cookies to making 
aspirin or some other chemical in a laboratory. A balanced chemical equation provides the same kind of quantitative information that a recipe does. In a cookie recipe, you can think of the ingredients as the reactants and the, and the cookies as the product. Here's another example. Imagine you are in charge of manufacturing for the tiny tyke tricycle company. That's far too many T's to be used in one time. The business plan for the tiny tyke requires the production of 640 custom-made tricycles each week. One of your responsibilities is to be sure that there are enough parts available at the start of each work week to make these tricycles. How can you determine the number of parts you need per week? Well, to simplify this discussion, assume that the major components of the tricycle are the frame, we're going to call it F, the seat is S, the wheels are W, the handlebars H, and the pedals P. In other words, your reactants. The figure below illustrates how an equation can represent the manufacturing of a single tricycle. The finished tricycle, your product, has a formula of FSW3 HP2. The balanced equation for making a single tricycle is F plus S plus 3W plus H plus 2P yields FSW3 HP2. Frame, seat, wheels, handlebars, and pedals. This equation is a recipe to make a single tricycle. Making a tricycle requires assembling one frame, one seat, three wheels, it's a tricycle, one handlebar, and two pedals. You have two feet. Now look at the sample problem one, approximately on the next slide. It shows you how to use the balanced equation to calculate the number of parts needed to manufacture a given number of tricycles. In a five-day work week, Tiny Tyke is scheduled to make 640 tricycles. How many wheels, how many wheels should be in the plant on Monday morning to make these tricycles? Now what we're going to do is we're doing a problem, sample problem one, in a five-day work week, 640 tricycles. And the first thing we've got to answer is how many wheels does that mean? So if you have 640 tricycles and you have three wheels per tricycle, let's look at it. Number of tricycles, 60, or 60 times FSW HP. And then you have your equation, F plus S plus 3W plus H plus 2P yields FSW3 HP2. Then you have... Uh, your equation. And from the equation, you're going to answer all kinds of questions. Uh, so you have, you have 600 of the tricycles. So it's going to be 3 times 640. 3 times 6 is 18. And then 3 times 40 is going to be 120. So let's figure that out. Okay, now, we just saw a picture of the making bicyc uh, tricycles and bicycles. All right, the number of wheels equals the number of wheels. The desired conversion is there. We know that. The balanced equation tells you that the, each tricycle has three wheels, or one F, FSW3 HP2 equals 3W. The, the problem can be solved by using the proper conversion factors derived from this expression. So you, write, you can write two conversion factors relating wheels to tricycles. Three wheels over... FSW3 HP2 and FS3 HP2 over 3W, the desired unit W, so use the conversion factor on the left, the one that has W in the numerator, multiply the number of tricycles by the conversion factor, it's listed there, and it's 1920 wheels, 1920, so that makes sense, 640 would be 1920. Let's evaluate the answer. Does the result make sense? If three wheels are required for each tricycle and a total of 600 tricycles are being made, then the number of wheels is in excess of 1,800 is a logical answer. The unit of the known cancels 
with the unit in the denominator and the conversion factor of the conversion factor and the answer is in the units of the unknown and we're done nearly everything you use is manufactured from chemicals soaps shampoos uh, conditioners CDs cosmetics medicines and clothing among other things in manufacturing such item the cost of making them cannot be greater than the price they are sold at otherwise the manufacturer will not make a profit therefore the chemical processes used in manufacturing must be carried out economically this is where balanced equations help a balanced chemical equation tells you what amounts of reactants to mix and what amounts of products to expect and remember conservation of mass don't forget chemists chemists use balanced chemical equations as a basis to calculate how much reactant is needed or product is formed in a reaction when you know the quantity of one substance in a reactant you can calculate the quantity of any other substance consumed or created in the reaction the key is to use the stoichiometric equation as written, then you put the stoichiometric masses above each component of the equation, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Quantities usually means the amount of a substance expressed in grams or moles. However, quantity could just as well be in liters, tons, or molecules. The calculation of quantities in chemical reactions is a subject of chemistry called stoichiometry calculations using balanced equations are called stoichiometric calculations gee using stoichiometric equations makes sense the chapter stoichiometry for chemists stoichiometry is a form of bookkeeping for example accountants can track income expenditures profits for small business by tallying each in dollars and cents chemists can track reactants and products in a reaction by stoichiometry it allows chemists to tally the amounts of reactants and products by using ratios of moles or representative particles checkpoint how is stoichiometry similar to bookkeeping well it keeps a track of how much of each is used in an actual chemical reaction and how much is left over and wasted if that's not accounting then I don't know but sounds like it in gardens such as the one shown in figure 2 approximately on the next slide fertilizers are often used to improve the growth of flowers as you may recall from chapter 10 ammonia is widely used as a fertilizer ammonia is produced industrially by the reaction of nitrogen with a with hydrogen N2 plus 3 H2 yields 2 NH3 don't forget that hydrogen is a gas nitrogen is a gas and ammonia is a gas the balanced chemical equation tells you the relative amounts of reactants and products in the reaction figure 2 gardeners use ammonium salts as fertilizer the nitrogen in these salts is essential to plant growth these are tulips in a beautiful arrangement we use fertilizers to to make those strong and healthy here's another flower garden you see the see the little little creek there it's also amazingly beautiful because in large to no small degree fertilizer okay here I have a, uh, a, an equation, a stoichiometric equation. Uh, N2 gas plus 3 H2 gas yields 2 NH3 gas. And the mass of one mole, because that's what's written there, one mole of nitrogen is 28. Three moles of H2, H is 1, H2 is 2, times 3 is 6. And two moles of ammonia, 17 plus 2 is 34. And now I know that... I have, if I have 28, let's say I have 56 grams of nitrogen, I can predict what I'm going to have in terms of hydrogen. 
What do you think? What's going to come out? Try to predict the product. Try to predict the product. Now, so if I'm doubling 28, I'm obviously getting 56. So if you double 6, you get what? You get 12. If you double 34, you get what? That's right, 68. So you get 56, 12, and then 68 should be the next answer. And you get 68. So I'm going to let this go. I'm going to give you one, and you have to give me the others, and see if you can, see if you can get this. And then we'll do a couple of more difficult problems as we, after about six or seven uh, slides. All right, try these yourself. You have 14, now what? All right, I'm still here. How are we doing? Notice you can add the two reactants and get the products. That's easy because you have the conservation of mass. Or you can just simply do what they're doing. To get 24, what did you do to 6? You multiply by 4. 4 times 28, 4 times 34. Okay. Now, what happens if you have 100 of the ammonia? That's a little bit weird. So I have 100 of the ammonia. So you set up the known equation. You have N, N2, oh, you have nitrogen over 2 moles of ammonia. So that's 34, 28 over 34. That's right from the equation. And then you say X over 100. You solve the equation. For X, you get 82 grams of nitrogen. So then <clears throat> you see that down below, uh, it's going to be easy. It says conservation of mass says that the left side of the equation must be 100, therefore the mass of the hydrogen is 18 because 100 minus 82 is 18. So I know that it's 82 grams of nitrogen and then 18 grams of, uh, of uh, hydrogen and that gives uh, 100 grams on the left and 100 grams on the right. Now, what happens if I start with 100 grams of nitrogen? Now, how much hydrogen will I need and how much ammonia will I produce? Okay, here's the, here's the deal. So it's 28 over 60 because it's nitrogen over hydrogen. I'm going to look for the hydrogen first. I'm get, I have 100 grams of nitrogen and I want to look for hydrogen first. So it's 28 over 6 equals 100 over X. X equals 21. If I add 121 together, I get 121. So the answer is... 21 grams for hydrogen and 121 grams for uh, ammonia. So I get the 21 there, and then I'm going to have the 121 for that. Okay, next. Now what happens if I have something completely different, and let's do a third problem to take care of the third component here, and let's say I have 100 grams of hydrogen, now that I'm going to I'm going to look at now so let me set up a problem nitrogen let me look for nitrogen so nitrogen over one nitrogen one mole of nitrogen over three moles of hydrogen equals 28 over 6 equals x over 100 so solve for x x equals 467 grams of nitrogen so I have 100 grams of hydrogen and 167 grams of nitrogen the conservation of mass we're going to employ that and we have, we have 467 plus 100 is 567 grams of ammonia. So, let's uncover. So I have 100 grams of hydrogen. That gives me 467 grams of nitrogen and 567 grams of ammonia. And that ends the problem. So that's really all we're doing. If you can understand a mass mass, that's key. You know, that's key. However, your interpretation of the equation depends on how you quantify the reactants and products. A balanced chemical equation can be interpreted in terms of different 
quantities, including numbers of atoms, molecules or moles, mass, and volume. As you study stoichiometry, you will learn how to read a chemical equation in terms of any of these quantities. Number of atoms at the atomic level, a balanced equation indicates that the number of the number and type of each atom that makes up the that makes up each reactant also makes up each product. Thus, both the number and types, both the number and types of atoms are not changed in a reaction. In the synthesis of ammonia, the reactants are composed of two atoms of nitrogen and six atoms of hydrogen. These eight atoms are recombined in the product. Number of molecules, the balanced equation indicates that one molecule of nitrogen reacts with three molecules of hydrogen. Nitrogen and hydrogen will always react to form ammonia in a 1-3-2 ratio of molecules. If you could make 10 molecules of nitrogen react with 30 molecules of hydrogen, you would expect to get 20 molecules of ammonia. Of course, it is not practical to count such small numbers of molecules and allow them to react. You could, however, take Avogadro's number of nitrogen molecules and make them react with three times Avogadro's number of hydrogen molecules. This would be, this would be the same one to three ratio of molecules of reactants. The reaction would form two times Avogadro's number of ammonia molecules. Mo moles, moles. A balanced chemical equation also tells you the number of moles of reactants and products. Coefficients of a balanced chemical equation indicate the relative numbers of moles of reactants and products in a chemical reaction. This is the most important information that a balanced chemical equation provides. Using this information, you can calculate the amounts of reactants and products. In the synthesis of ammonia, one mole of nitrogen molecules reacts with three moles of hydrogen molecules to form two moles of ammonia molecules. As you can see from this reaction, the total number of moles of reactants does not equal the total number of moles of product. Checkpoint. What do the coefficients of a balanced chemical equation indicate? Mass. A balanced chemical equation obeys the laws of conservation of mass. This law states that mass can neither be created nor destroyed in an ordinary chemical or physical process. As you recall, the number, of type, the number and types of atoms does not change in a chemical reaction. Therefore, the total mass of the atoms in the reaction does not change. Law of conservation of mass. If you assume standard temperature and pressure, the equation also tells you about the volumes of gas. Recall that one mole of any gas at STP occupies a volume of 22.4 liters. The equation indicates that 22.4 liters of nitrogen react with 67.2 liters of hydrogen. This reaction forms 44.8 liters of ammonia. Figure 3 summarizes the information derived from the balanced chemical equation for the formation of ammonia. As you can see, the mass of the reactants equals the mass of the products. In addition, the number of atoms of each type in the reactants equals the number of atoms of each type of the product. Mass and atoms are conserved in every chemical equation. And this is what I did earlier on. It's a very simple process. The book makes it into this very big, broad, vague, detailed kind of abstraction. It really isn't. 
The balanced chemical equation for the formation of ammonia can be interpreted in several ways. How many molecules of ammonia could be made from five molecules of nitrogen and 15 molecules of hydrogen? So what you do is look at the balanced formula equation and do a mole ratio. So here's the, here's the simplification of it, and you can see this is similar to what I did. Two atoms, you know, you have um, one, one nitrogen, three hydrogen, and two ammonia. Or you would double it, two, six, and four. Or you would multiply it by ten, ten, thirty, and twenty, etc. So it's all proportional. They are all proportional. If you look at the volume, the volumes are proportional as well, down at the bottom of that page. So if I have 22.4 nitrogen, I'm going to have 66, 67.2 hydrogen, and 44.8 uh, ammonia. So it's all proportional relative to masses and masses and volumes. Earth's atmosphere contains 0 0.01 parts per million of ammonia and small amounts of ammonia occur in volcanic gases. Most ammonia cycles through the living world without returning to the atmosphere. Ammonia plays a role in several stages of the nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen fixing bacteria form nodules or swellings on the roots of plants in the legume family such as beans and clover plants. So as a result ammonia is a very very important chemical in our environment. These bacteria change atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia molecules or ammonium ions. Other bacteria break down the nitrogenous material in dead plants and animals into ammonia molecules. Certain soil bacteria oxidize these molecules into nitrate ions, the form readily absorbed by plant roots. When a plant dies, this cycle begins again. Again, so how does nitrogen get into the cycle, get into our environment? However, molecules, formula units, moles, and volumes are not necessarily conserved. Although they may be, consider for example the formation of hydrogen iodide. So the, the formula is H2 plus I2 yields 2HI, two, 2 plus 254 yields 256. In this reaction, molecules, moles, and volumes are all conserved, but in the majority of chemical reactions, they are not. Hydrogen, interpreting a balanced chemical equation, otherwise known as a stoichiometric equation. Hydrogen sulfide, which smells like rotten eggs, is found in volcanic gases. The balanced equation for the building of hydrogen sulfide is 2H2S plus 3O2 yields 2SO2 plus 2H2O. Don't forget the the gases, they're all gases, all Gs, interpret this equation in terms of number of representative particles and moles. B, masses of reactants and products. Got it. So now, what we'll look at, we'll look at various parts of this problem. So here are some pictures of some volcanic activity, giving off many chemicals, ammonia of which is one of them. There are many chemicals given off by a volcano. Here's some of the anatomy and, uh, so to speak, um, function of a volcano. Here are some pictures of a crater. Inside the crater, you get a lot of smoke. You can see in the lower right, sulfur, the yellow sulfur that forms from the gases that precipitates out. So we want to analyze the coefficients in the balanced equation give the relative number of molecules or moles of reactants and products. B. A balanced chemical equation obeys the law of conservation of mass. So when you look at this, you look at these values, these things, this, this, 
this analysis A and B. Now, let's go back. Uh, you want to solve. So, two molecules of H2S plus three molecules of O2 yield two molecules of SO2 plus two molecules of H2O, and then we come down and we see the balanced formula equation. It's at lowest terms, two to three to two to two. That is lowest terms. If the oxygen was a two, then it could be one to one to one to one, but it's all two to three to two to two. Now here's a distinct look at part B, and that is if you go from bottom up, you see that H2S has a mass of 34 grams, O2 has a mass of 32 grams, SO2 has a mass of 64 grams, and H2O has a mass of 18 grams. Now, if you multiply that by the number of moles of each, so 2 times 34 is 68 grams. I'm going up. See how the arrow's going up? And then 3 times 32 grams is 96 grams. And then 64 times 2 is 128. 18 times 2 is 36. 128 plus 36 is 164. And 68 plus 96 is 164. 164 equals 164. This is the basis of what I do in stoichiometry. I look at stoichiometric masses. So when I write the equation, I put the masses of that many moles of reactant or product above the particular member of the reactant or product. For instance, the <clears throat> yellow outline just above the 2H2S68, that's what I'll put there. So I'll put in when I balance the stoichiometric equation, I'll put in 68, 96, 128, 36, and everything else is a proportional relationship from that point on, and that's how I do it. A little bit of a conflict with the book. You can do whatever you want. The test is whether or not you get the right answer. Airbags inflate almost instantaneously upon a car's impact. The effectiveness of Airbags is based on the rapid conversion of a small mass of sodium azide into a large volume of gas. The gas fills an airbag, preventing the driver from hitting the steering wheel or dashboard. The entire reaction occurs in less than a second. It is in this section you will learn how to use a balanced chemical equation to calculate the amount of product formed in a chemical reaction. Let's take a look at some airbag chemistry. Here we have what's happening when the airbag is deployed almost instantaneously. The driver goes forward and as the driver goes forward the airbag is filled and the driver uh, crashes essentially into the airbag and the concept is if I throw an egg way high in the air and I catch it with a sheet being stretched out it won't it won't break the egg. Well, the idea is the head is the egg. Here I have another, uh, another shot where the head is being protect protected. I'm not sure the back is being protected here, but the head at least is being protected by the forward lurch in the accident. Uh, the legs are also vulnerable, but they are being, being uh, thrust forward by the impact and their head again is being protected. However, a lot of cars have a variety of different airbags in them to protect different parts of the body. Older airbag formulations contained mixtures of oxidizers and sodium azide and other agents including igniters and accelerants. An electronic controller detonates this mixture during an automobile crash. Two moles of sodium azide yield two moles of sodium plus three moles of nitrogen gas, N2. Notice the sodium. It's sodium metal. The same reaction occurs upon heating the salt to approximately 300 degrees Celsius. The sodium that is formed is a potential hazard alone, and in automobile airbags, it is converted by reaction with other ingredients such as potassium nitrate and silica. In the latter case, innocuous sodium silicates are generated. 
Sodium azide is also used in airplane escape chutes. Newer generation airbags contain nitroguanidine or similar less sensitive explosives. The, the main thing the main thing would have to be that they would have to be able to produce enough uh, gas. Nitroguanidine is an organic compound with the formula NH2, two of them, CNNO2. It is a colorless crystalline solid that melts at 232 degrees Celsius and decomposes at 250 degrees Celsius. It is not flammable and is a low sensitivity explosive. However, this is key, its detonation velocity is high. As you have learned, a balanced chemical equation provides a great deal of quantitative information. It relates particles, atoms, molecules, formula units, moles of substances, and masses. A balanced chemical equation also is essential for all calculations involving amounts of reactants and products. For example, suppose you know the number of moles of one substance. The balanced chemical equation allows you to determine the number of moles of all the other substances in the reaction. Look again at the balanced equation for the production of ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen. 28 grams of nitrogen, one mole, three moles of hydrogen, that's six grams, and 34 grams for two moles of ammonia. The most important interpretation of this equation is that one mole of nitrogen reacts with three moles of hydrogen to form two moles of ammonia. Based on this interpretation, you can write ratios that relate moles of reactants to moles of product. A mole ratio is a conversion factor derived from the coefficients of a balanced chemical equation interpreted in terms of moles. In chemical calculations, mole ratios are used to convert between moles of reactant and moles of product, between moles of reactants or between moles of product. Three mole ratios derived from the balanced equation above are, based on this equation that we'll look at, N2 plus 3H2 plus uh, 2NH3, we'll do this very slowly, and we'll change the timing so it goes a little bit more quickly, and then we'll assess what we have seen. Okay, here we go. Now we're setting things up with the stoichiometric masses, and now we're going to look at the various mole ratios that can exist as a result of that equation. So I have two moles of ammonia per one mole of nitrogen. That equals 34 grams over 28 grams of hydrogen, or you could flip that. Three moles of hydrogen over two moles of ammonia equals six grams over 34 grams, nitrogen over hydrogen. Or you could say one mole of nitrogen over three moles of hydrogen, which is 28 grams of nitrogen over six grams of hydrogen. So those are the, those are the ratios that you can form when it comes to this particular equation and their constant ratios. In other words, the, mass, the masses that I wrote in are constant. They will never change ever. Figure 4, manufacturing plants produce ammonia by combining nitrogen with hydrogen. Ammonia is used in cleaning products, fertilizers, and in the manufacture of other chemicals. So ammonia is an uh, is amazing uh, chemical. It's used so widely from cleaning floors. You use a dilute solution to making a variety of chemicals. You have this, uh, the Burrup liquid ammonia plant is the largest of its kind in the world and has a production capacity of 760 thousand tons annually. Uh, this is a, an amazing chemical that's used throughout the world and uh, it is uh, a lifeline for for many many uh, fertilizers and other other uh, plastics etc. Here is the ammonia and urea plant in Oman, the ammonia and urea plant in Indonesia. Extra credit if you can tell me what urea is and what it's used for. 
mole mole cal as well as some ammonia um, applications. Mole mole calculations. In the mole ratio below, W is the unknown quantity and G is the given quantity. The values of A and B are the coefficients from the balanced equation. Thus, a general solution for a mole mole problem, such as sample problem 2, approximately on the next slide, is given by the equation below. You have given, you have the mole ratio, and you have calculated. If you read the equation, it says x mole g times the ratio b mole w over a mole g equals x b over a mole w. Boy, does that sound like a bunch of gobbledygook. Well, let's see what we can do with it, or with my method. How many moles of ammonia are produced when 0.6 moles of nitrogen react with hydrogen? Okay, here is the equation. All right, how many moles of ammonia are produced when 0.6 moles of nitrogen, so we're assuming that all the nitrogen is cooked. Okay, well remember, it's one mole of nitrogen per two moles of ammonia. So, let's see what we got. The known is moles of nitrogen equals 0.6 nitrogen, and the unknown is moles of ammonia. We don't know. We know that the ratio of the moles of ammonia over the, mo the moles of nitrogen or 2 over 1. The conversion is moles of nitrogen to moles of ammonia. According to the balanced equation, one mole of nitrogen combines with three moles of hydrogen to produce two moles ammonia. To determine the number of moles of ammonia, the given quantity of N2 is multiplied by the form of the mole ratio from the balanced equation that allows the given unit to cancel. This mole ratio is, here it is, it's just 2. It's 2 to 1, so it's just 2 times 0.6. So it's 0.6 times the ratio, 2 over 1, and it's going to be the moles of nitrogen cancel, and you're left with moles of ammonia, and you're just simply multiplying it by 2 fairly straightforward, fairly straightforward. So, the answer is 1.2 moles of ammonia. So, it's all in the ratios. It's, uh, you could set it up as in a proportional relationship and it would make just as much sense. That's exactly what you would do. The ratio of 1 to 1.2 moles of ammonia to 0.6 of uh, moles of nitrogen is 2 to 1, as predicted by the balanced formula equation, otherwise known as a stoichiometric equation. It's called a stoichiometric equation. Mass mass calculations. No laboratory balance can measure substances directly in moles. Instead, the amount of substance is usually determined by measuring its mass in grams, as shown in Figure 5, approximately on the next slide. From the mass of a reactant or product, the mass of any other reactant or product is a given chemical equation can be calculated. The mole interpretation of a balanced equation is the basis for this conversion. If the given sample is measured in grams, the mass can be converted to moles by using the molar mass. And then, if you need to convert back to grams, then you do that. You convert from grams to moles to moles to grams. However, we'll take a look at that in a minute. To determine the number of moles in a sample of a compound, first measure the mass of the sample. Then, use the molar mass to calculate the number of moles in that mass. Here is a very sensitive analytical balance being used in a, could be a college laboratory or a high school laboratory where your answer is very specific. Calculate the number of grams of ammonia produced by the reaction of 5.4 grams of hydrogen with an excess of nitrogen. The balanced equation is N2 plus 3H2 plus 2NH3, all in the gaseous form. So again, we're going to do it. I'm not sure how I wrote it out, but you're going to use that equation, and that's called a stoichiometric equation. It's the balanced chemical equation. This is what we know. The mass of the hydrogen is 5.4 grams, 
the we have three moles of hydrogen equals two moles of ammonia from the balanced equation. One mole of hydrogen is two grams, that's the molar mass, and one mole of ammonia is 17 grams, that's molar mass. So that's just the molar mass, that's not anything else. So that's what the book gives. So let's see how let's see how we solved it. It says the mass of ammonia equals question mark, that's the unknown. The mass in grams of hydrogen will be used to find the mass in grams of ammonia. So the mass in grams of hydrogen will be used to find the mass in grams of the ammonia. Now, so let's look at the next slide and see what it is. While we're waiting, if you understand the fact that a stoichiometric equation has the masses above it as I put it, let's go back to that in a minute, the following steps, we're still looking at the, un the analysis, the final steps are necessary to determine the mass of ammonia. So you're going from mass of hydrogen to moles of hydrogen to moles of ammonia to mass of ammonia. So if you put the stoichiometric masses above the equation and then set up very simple proportional relationships relative to the masses, then you can solve for any mass you want. So again, we're still doing the analysis. The coefficients of the balanced equation show that three moles of hydrogen reacts with one mole of nitrogen to produce two moles of ammonia. The ratio, the mole ratio relating ammonia and hydrogen is two moles of ammonia over three moles of hydrogen. Or I could flip that, it doesn't matter as long as the the all the hydrogens and all the ammonias are on the correct side. Now this is the way I did it. This is the way I did it. I'm saying, I'm saying the stoichiometric masses are 28 grams, 6 grams, 34 grams. As soon as you get a stoichiometric equation, right off the bat, you're right in the masses. And we see they're equal to 34 on the left, 34 grams on the right. That's conservation of mass. So you put 5.4 grams underneath the, uh, underneath the hydrogen and X underneath the ammonia, and you're ready to rock and roll. Okay, so... It says two moles of ammonia over three moles of hydrogen. This particular method includes all of the conversions mentioned in the analysis. All those uh, crazy conversions that they were talking about is really what I'm doing. I'm just making it look a little bit less painful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, right, two moles of ammonia, that's what I have there. That's 34 grams. 34 grams over 6 grams equals X over 5.4. Can you do basic basic middle school math, or even earlier, and do proportional relationships. So two moles of ammonia over three moles of hydrogen equals 34 grams of ammonia over six grams of hydrogen. That's what's written in the chemical stoichiometric equation. Equals X moles of ammonia. That's what I'm solving for. Over 5.4 grams of hydrogen. X equals 30.6. You cross, multiply, and divide. Because there are three conversion factors involved in this solution, it is more difficult to estimate an answer. It's not more difficult to estimate an answer. Just write it in the stoichiometric masses. However, because the molar mass of ammonia is substantially greater than the molar mass of hydrogen, the answer should have a larger mass than the given mass. The answer should have two significant figures. Again, the book continually says that two or three is just fine. Then the mole ratio from the balanced equation can be used to calculate the number of moles of the unknown. If it is the mass of the unknown that needs to be determined, the number of moles of the unknown can be multiplied by the molar mass. As in mole-mole calculations, the unknown can be either a reactant or a product. If the law of conservation of mass is true, how is it possible to make 31 grams ammonia from only 5.4 grams of hydrogen? Looking back at the equation for the reaction, you will see that hydrogen is not the only reactant. There is ammonia. Look at the mass of ammonia that's being used relative to hydrogen. Figure 6. In this Hubble space telescope image, clouds of condensed ammonia are visible covering the surface of Saturn. 
Here is Saturn, and here is the clouds that are mentioned in the former slide. I have another Hubble telescope picture of Saturn. Really amazing, 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 amazing that we can see it that clearly from Earth, and it's literally millions and millions of miles away. Another reactant, nitrogen, is also involved. If you were to calculate, we're going back to the problem, the number of grams of nitrogen needed to produce 31 grams of ammonia and then compare the total masses of reactants and products, you would have an answer to this question. Go ahead and try it. Mass-mass problems are solved in basically the same way as mole-mole problems. Figure 7, approximately on the next slide, reviews the steps for the mass-mass conversion of any given mass, G, and any wanted mass, W. So we're going to see how they do it. Again, they're making it sound, I don't mean to sound negative, but they're making it into a little bit of gobbledygook. This general solution diagram indicates the steps necessary to solve a mass-mass stoichiometry problem. Convert masses to moles, use the mole ratio, and then convert moles to masses. Inferring. Is the given always a reactant? Is the given always a reactant? And the answer is absolutely not. So, so you have the... the um, Quantity, given quantity, and the wanted quantity. Those are the moles. A and B are moles. So you multiply the mass of capital G, uh, and you multiply that through. I'm just going to let you kind of like look at the problem. And uh, if you want to do it that way, you have, you are absolutely positively can do that. The key is what, what do you choose? Well, what one is easiest to get the correct answer. Okay, writing and using mole ratios. Steps in solving mass-mass problems. Number one, change the mass of G to moles of G. Mass G use mo goes to moles of G by using the molar mass of G. Mass G times one mole G over molar mass G equals mole G. Number two, Change the moles of G to moles of W. Mole G to mole W by using the mole ratio from the balanced equation. Now, mole G times B mole W over A mole W over A mole G. Now, A and B are from the equation. Equals mole W. So that's what we're going to do. Those are the first two steps in solving a mass-mass problem. The third step is change the moles of W to grams of W, moles W to mass W by using the molar mass of W. Mass G times one mole G over molar mass G equals mole G. And that concludes the three steps to use when writing and using mole ratios to solve a mass-mass stoichiometric problem. Figure 7, approximately on the next slide, also shows the steps for doing mole-mass and mass-mole stoichiometric calculations. For a mole-mass problem, the first conversion from mass to moles is skipped. From, for a mass-mole problem, the last conversion from moles to mass is skipped. You can use parts of the three-step process shown in figure 7, approximately the next slide. I think it's a former slide. No, it is on the next slide as well. As they are appropriate to the problem you are solving. So let's look again at the, uh, at the procedure for solving a mass-mass problem. This time we're going to look at mass-mole and mole-mass, etc. Here is the problem. So I can, short, I can short circuit this at any time in the process. I can short, short circuit this process. So I can skip the first step, I can skip the last step, etc. So look at this, uh, look at this figure, uh, write it down in your books, and uh, it will be very helpful if you want to embrace 
this method. Just keep in mind, the method I use and the method they use, it's really the same. I simply make it a little bit more user-friendly. You can use parts of the three-step process as shown in Figure 7, approximately on the next slide, as they are appropriate to the problem you are solving. Okay, here's another shot at the figure which shows you the process by which the book is solving mass mass problems and I really have to go over it but again there are easier ways as you already know you can obtain mole ratios from the balanced chemical equation otherwise known as a stoichiometric equation from the mole ratios you can calculate any measurement unit that is related to the mole the given quantity can be expressed in numbers of representative particles units of mass or volumes of gas at STP. The problems can include mass volume, particle mass, and volume volume calculations. For example, you can use stoichiometry to relate volumes of reactants and products in the reactants shown in figure 8 on approximately the next slide. So if you want to look at the moles, if you say there's two moles of a gas that's going to be 22.4 times 2. Uh, if there were three moles, such as uh, hydrogen, that would be 22.4 times uh, 3. So here we have figure 8. With your knowledge of conversion factors and this problem-solving approach, you can solve a variety of stoichiometric problems, identifying what conversion factors or what conversion factor is used to convert moles to representative particles. That's a question for you. If you have any question about this, uh, about this movie, just please write them down and, and tell me in class. So here we have a little bit more of an expanded version of, the, of that chart, which takes into account uh, uh, particles, uh, volume, and mass. So that's a little bit more in depth. So I'll let you study this for a moment before we carry on. Same, same exact idea, but again, it's a little bit different. And notice it all goes to the center. It goes to moles. That's at the center. In a typical stoichiometric problem, the given quantity is first converted to moles. Then the mole ratio from the balanced equation is used to calculate the number of moles of the wanted substance. Finally, the moles are converted to any other unit of measurement related to the unit mole, as the problem requires. Thus far, you have learned how to use the relationship between moles and mass. One mole equals the molar mass. In solving mass mass, mass mole, and mole mass stoichiometric problems. The mole mass relationship gives you two conversion factors. Recall from chapter 10 that the mole can be related to other quantities as well. For example, one mole equals 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd representative particles, and one mole of a gas equals 22.4 liters at STP. These two relationships provide four more conversion factors that you can use in stoichiometric calculations. Figure 8, approximately on the next slide, summarizes the steps for a typical stoichiometric problem. Notice that the units of the given quantity will not necessarily be the same as the units of the wanted quantity. Now, understand this. This is not the way I do things. It's a little bit, I don't know, complicated. And what happens is you lose the sight of the chemistry involved. You can do it this way, and the ratio changes that you see here, or the ratio conversions, I do the same. But notice, though, that the central aspect of this is the moles. And remember the map that we saw uh, uh, in Chapter 10 uh, relative to mole calculations. Everything centered around the mole. So you see mole G times the ratio of mole W over mole G based on the, the coefficients from the equation will yield mole W. So 
the idea of the mold being the central factor is still the same regardless of the method in which you employ to do the calculations. For example, given the mass of G, you might be asked to calculate the volume of W at STP. Checkpoint. What conversion factors can you write based on the mole mass and mole volume relationships? The coefficients in a chemical equation indicate the relative number of particles and the relative number of moles of reactants and products. For a reaction involving gaseous reactants or products, the coefficients also indicate relative amounts of each gas. In terms of the moles. Sample problem four, calculating molecules of a product. How many molecules of oxygen are produced when 29.2 grams of water is decomposed by electrolysis according to this balanced equation? Two moles of water yield two moles of hydrogen plus one mole of oxygen. Let's skip the long-winded method and just begin the solution. Now here is an apparatus that is used to find the, uh, the relationship between oxygen and hydrogen, and it's called a Hoffman apparatus. And in the Hoffman apparatus, you'll see that the mole ra ratio of hydrogen to oxygen is, is 2 to 1, and that's what happens in the Hoffman apparatus. I will take the Hoffman apparatus out, and we will use it and play with it to produce hydrogen and oxygen gas in 2 to 1 ratios relative to hydrogen to oxygen. And here is the decomposition of water, a more visual effect, and you see that you have two moles of water on the left, and then you get two moles of, of hydrogen. I think I have two molecules of water and two molecules of hydrogen, and then one molecule of oxygen. You could either say two molecules or two moles. It's simply a ratio what it comes down to. So, and then, I, but what it doesn't say is you need to use sodium nitrate to conduct electricity because water it does not conduct electricity. So you need to put a salt in there, and oftentimes the salt is sodium nitrate. Okay, here we have it. 36 grams of water, that's what the stoichiometric equation says, 4 grams of hydrogen, 32 grams of oxygen. Right. 29.2 grams of water. So, if, it's, if 36 produces 32, how much does 29 produce? So you set up your ratios. One mole O2 gas over two moles H2O liquid equals 32 grams over 36 from the equation above equals X oxygen over 29.2 water. 32 times 29.2 divided by 36, cross multiply and divide. X equals 26 grams of O2 gas. Moles of oxygen is 26 over 32, which equals 0.81 moles. That's the number of moles that are produced given that particular series of calculations. So, um, I'm producing 26 grams, not 32. So what fraction of a mole is that? Well, it's 26 over 32. Why 32? Because 32 is the mass of one mole, 30, 26 over 32 is 0.8 moles. That's how much I actually produce. So here I have, now I need to know the number of particles. So I say, well, one mole of O2 over 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd equals 0.81 moles over X. So I cross multiply 0.81 moles times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules uh, divided by 1 equals 4.88 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of O2 gas. It looks like a little bit more work, but I think it's so much more straightforward than the method that they employ. And you know what? It's the exact same mathematics, just done in a little bit different of a way. The given mass of water should produce a little less than one mole of oxygen, or a little less than Avogadro's number of molecules. The answer should have three significant figures. And that's approximately correct. You know, it's always said, I, I know that I fight with the book in terms of significant figures, but it always says two or three, and that's really what you end up solving for anyway. Anything more than that is simply nonsense. As a result, you can use volume ratios in the same way you have used mole ratios. Did you notice that in sample problem five, approximately on the next slide, 
the 22.4 liters per mole factors canceled out. This will always be true in a volume volume problem. Nitrogen monoxide and oxygen gas combine to form the brown gas nitrogen dioxide, which contributes to photochemical smog. How many liters of nitrogen dioxide are produced when 34 liters of oxygen reacts with an excess of nitrogen monoxide assume conditions of STP? Now, here is the stoichiometric equation. Two nitrogen monoxide gas moles plus one oxygen gas mole yields two nitrogen dioxide gas moles. Now, in the next picture, you're going to see smog. Here's the smog. You know, London, back in the 19th century, with all the coal being burned, had this famous smog called pea soup, this tremendous London fog. It was actually smog. And when you combine this orange haze with, with, um, with, with, uh, with moisture, with humidity, you produce this horrific, dense material that just literally sticks to the lungs and creates all kinds of health problems. China, for instance, is having a terrible problem. The United States had terrible problems with smog in the early 70s. Uh, when I lived in Madrid, Spain in the winter, the smog was horrific. You could hardly see Madrid from across the valley, across Casa de Campo. Uh, terrific. Here is a, here is a, uh, a, a ratio of, uh, that we'll use often. And it says, remember, one mole of gas at STP equals 22.4 liters. And the conversion factor would be one mole of nitrogen dioxide gas over 22.4 liters. Remember, that's STP. So let's put to use, let's put to good use this conversion factor when we're looking at this problem. So it says this particular method includes all the conversions mentioned in the analysis. So here we have uh, two moles of nitrogen monoxide, one mole of oxygen, and two moles of nitrogen dioxide. So we're going to focus in on, we're going to focus in on oxygen and nitrogen dioxide. So we have 60 grams of nitrogen monoxide in two moles. We have one mole of oxygen, that's 32 grams, and two moles of nitrogen dioxide, that's 92 grams. Okay, now, we have 34 moles of oxygen, and we want to know what volume of gas is going to be produced. Well, we know that it's one to two. One mole of oxygen to two moles of nitrogen dioxide. So we don't really have to understand necessarily what we're doing, because we're simply going to right away convert this to a volume. So you're going to say one mole of oxygen to two moles of nitrogen dioxide is going to be 34 is one mole and then it's going to be 68 liters of the of the nitrogen dioxide. And that's exactly what this calculation shows. You have one mole O2 over two moles of NO2, so it's going to be it's going to be two times 34 divided by one equals x, and x equals 68. Again, I'm simply setting up a proportional relationship. It's something you learn in middle school, and it kind of sticks with you. It's a very basic form of math, and it's so incredibly usable, and so that's why I one reason I use it. Because two moles of nitrogen dioxide is produced for each one mole of oxygen that reacts, the volume of nitrogen dioxide should be twice the given volume of oxygen. Now, finding the volume of a gas needed for a reaction. This is sample problem six. Assuming STP, how many milliliters of oxygen are needed to produce 20.4 milliliters SO3 according to this balanced equation. 128 grams of sulfur dioxide, 32 grams of oxygen, and 160 grams of 
sulfur trioxide. Now, what am I going to do with this equation? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write in what I want and what I need and what I have. Well, so I have uh, 20.4 milliliters of sulfur trioxide, and I want to uh, solve for the amount of oxygen I need in order to accomplish that. So what I'm going to say is, I'm going to say uh, one mole of O2 over two moles of SO3 equal X over 20.4 milliliters. And so I'm going to say 1 times 20.4 divided by 2, cross multiply and divide, equals X. And X equals 10.2 milliliters. Very, 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 very simple. Very simple. Because the volume ratio is two volumes sulfur trioxide to one volume oxygen, the volume of oxygen should be half the volume of sulfur trioxide, and that is indeed the case. To conclude the section, let's look at something called other stoichiometric calculations. Remember that coefficients in a balanced chemical equation indicate the relative number of moles. The coefficients also indicate the relative volumes of interacting gases. If a carpenter had two tabletops and seven table legs, he would have difficulty building more than one functional four-legged table. The first table would require four of the legs, leaving just three legs for the second table. In this case, the the number of table legs is the limiting factor in the construction of four-legged tables. A similar concept applies in chemistry. The amount of product made in a chemical reaction may be limited by the amount of one or more of the reactants. Here we have Mr. Carpenter building uh, possibly a table, and he would have a difficult time making two tables out of seven legs. Many cooks follow a recipe when making a new dish. They know that sufficient quantities of all the ingredients must be available. Suppose, for example, that you are preparing to make lasagna and you have more than enough meat, tomato sauce, regatta cheese, eggs, mozzarella cheese, spinach, and seasoning on hand. However, you have only a half a box of lasagna noodles. The amount of lasagna you can make will be limited by the quantity of noodles you have. So the same thing is true. And it doesn't matter how much of one reactant you have. If you don't have very much of the other, it's going to limit the amount of product you're going to make. It's as simple as that. Thus, the noodles are the limiting ingredient in this baking venture. Figure 9, approximately on the next slide, illustrates another example of a limiting ingredient in the kitchen. A chemist often faces a similar situation. In a chemical reaction, an insufficient quantity of any of the reactants will limit the amount of the product that is formed. Limiting reagent, that's what we're going to talk about. Figure 9, the amount of product is determined by the quantity of the limiting reagent. In this example, the rolls are the limiting reagent. No matter how much of the other ingredients you have with two rolls, you can only make two sandwiches. And the same is going to be true for any chemical reaction, regardless of the amount of one reactant you have over another. Here are some sandwiches, uh, then you're going to be limiting based on the number of rolls you have. If you only have two rolls or three rolls, you're only going to be able to make that many sandwiches. If you have dozens of rolls you're going to, and you only have a couple of slices of meat, you're only, you're only going to be able to make a supply of sandwiches based on the limited meat you have. So either way, it's not an easy situation to overcome unless you have more, more chemicals involved. With this appetizing plate of cold cuts, you can 
make no sandwiches if you have no bread, but you can still eat, but you're not going to eat sandwiches. So, so get some bread. As you know, a balanced chemical equation is the chemist's recipe. You can interpret the recipe on a microscopic scale, interacting particles, or on a macroscopic scale, interacting moles. The coefficients used to write the balanced equation give both the ratio of representative particles and the mole ratio. Recall the e equation for the preparation of ammonia, and there it is. When one molecule, mole, of nitrogen reacts with three molecules or moles of hydrogen, two, mole, two molecules or moles of ammonia are produced. What would happen if two molecules or moles of nitrogen reacted with three molecules, moles of, of hydrogen? Would more than two molecules or moles of ammonia be formed? Figure 10, approximately on the next slide, shows both the particle and the mole interpretation of this problem. Before the reaction takes place, nitrogen and hydrogen are present in a 2 to 3 molecule-mole ratio. Figure 10, the recipe calls for three molecules of hydrogen for every one molecule of nitrogen. In this particular experiment, Hydrogen is the limiting reagent, and nitrogen is in excess, inferring. How would the amount of products formed change if you started with four molecules of nitrogen and three molecules of hydrogen? Well, first let's understand the limiting reagent idea. Here we have the equation, the microscopic and the macroscopic, and we have the experimental conditions. We have two molecules of nitrogen, three molecules of hydrogen, and we want to find the products. So after the reaction, we have one molecule of nitrogen left over, and we still have only two molecules of ammonia, because that's what's predicted relative to the number of particles in the problem based on the microscopic version. The reaction takes place according to the balanced equation. One molecule or mole of nitrogen reacts with three molecules moles of hydrogen to produce two molecules moles of ammonia. At this point, all the hydrogen has been used up, and the reaction stops. One molecule mole of unreacted nitrogen is left in addition to the two molecules moles of ammonia that have been produced by the reaction. In this reaction, only the hydrogen is completely used up. The fact that you used more of one substance that you need is not going to encourage the production of more product. It's simply going to be a waste. It is the limiting reagent or the reagent that determines the amount of product that can be formed by a reaction. The reaction occurs only until the limiting reagent is used up. By contrast, the reaction that is not completely used up in a reaction is called the excess reagent. In this example, nitrogen is the excess reagent because some nitrogen will remain unreacted. Sometimes in stoichiometric problems, the given quantities of reactants are expressed in units other than moles. In such cases, the first step in the solution is to convert each reactant to moles then the limiting reagent can be identified. The amount of product formed in a reaction can be determined from the given amount of limiting reagent. Checkpoint. How do limiting and excess reagents differ? In sample problem 7, approximately the next slide, you may have noticed that even though the mass of copper used in the reaction is greater than the mass of sulfur, copper is the limiting reagent. The reactant that is present in the smaller amount by mass or volume is not necessarily the limiting reagent. You've got to look at the moles or use a technique that I like to use. Copper reacts with sulfur to form copper 1 sulfide according to the following balanced equation. 2 copper plus 1 sulfur yields 1 copper 1 sulfide. What is the limiting reagent when 80 grams of copper reacts with 25 grams of sulfur. 
Now, what I want to do is, or what I would do is, I would simply plug in the values and see how much of each is going to be needed. Here's a, here's a look at copper and sulfur and copper sulfide. Very simple. Okay, here we go. Here's, what's, here's what we have. We have the mass of copper is 80 grams. The mass of sulfur is 25 grams. We want to go, the number of moles of each reactant must first be found if we want to do that technique. We'll say the mass of copper to the moles of copper and the mass of sulfur to the moles of sulfur. And then we do the reaction <clears throat> uh, and we proceed to see what's in, what is in excess and what is limiting. We're going to continue with the analysis. The balanced equation is used to calculate the number of moles of one reactant needed to react with the given amount of the other reactant. Mole of copper to mole of sulfur. The mole ratio relating to mole, the relating mole sulfur to mole copper from the balanced chemical equation is one mole sulfur to two moles copper. Now, here we go. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert them to moles and I'm going to say grams of copper to moles of copper. Okay, according to the original equation and the constant ratio of two copper over one sulfur, there has to be twice as much copper as sulfur. Therefore, the reaction is limited by the amount of copper. If all the copper is consumed, then there is sufficient sulfur. But if all the sulfur is consumed, there must be 1.56 moles of copper. Let's see what that means. So, 80 grams of copper divided by 64 is 1.25 moles of copper. Grams of sulfur to moles of sulfur, 25.0 grams of sulfur divided by 32 is 0.78 moles of sulfur. So, I have 1.25 moles of copper and 0.78 moles of sulfur. Okay, so we're talking about the limiting reagent. So if you look at the values, the 80 grams over 64 AMUs is 1.25 moles of copper and 0.78 moles of, moles of sulfur. Okay, now, if that's the case, then you have, you have the copper should be twice the sulfur. So if you, if you divided 1.25 in half, you would get 0.625. That's all you need. If you have 0 .7, uh, 0.78, you would need almost 1.6. Well, you don't have that. So obviously, the copper is going to be the limiting reagent. So I said, I've quickly discovered that I have more sulfur than I need and therefore the copper is limiting. I can also determine the uh, amount of sulfur in excess, 0.155 moles or 5 grams. Here's another way of looking at it. Um, I'm going to pick copper and I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to compare copper with sulfur. So I have from the stoichiometric ratios, I have 2 copper over 1 sulfur equals 128 copper grams of copper over 32 grams of sulfur equals 80 grams of copper over how much sulfur. So I solve for the amount of sulfur I actually need. And the amount of sulfur I actually need is 20 grams of sulfur. And there's a little round off error there because I said I'd have 4.96 left over, but I would have 5 left over according to this calculation because I'm using mass numbers and so it's a little round off error that's not a problem. So I would actually need 20 grams of sulfur and that's consistent with the calculations I did on the last slide. So the answer to the problem is that the 80 grams of copper is the limiting reagent, sulfur is in excess, and you need actually only 20 grams of sulfur and you'll have 5 grams of sulfur left over in excess and that's the problem.
problem that we have and have as we become more and more sulfur is the reaction is limited by the amount of copper converted into grams of copper per mole. So if you convert it into grams of copper per mole, you yield a CP4 of 2, 1.25. 2, 1.25. So if I, if I test whether or not sulfur will work, I simply say, right, 128 grams of copper over 32 grams of sulfur, that's the constant ratio, the constant mass ratio, and I say, right, let me find the amount of copper I need to react with 25 grams of sulfur, and it comes up with a 100 grams of copper. There is not enough copper to react with the given quantity of sulfur. This is the non-fact, the excess. Therefore, the limiting reagent is the copper, and the sulfur is in excess by 5 grams, round off error. So what I do is I simply test. I compare to one another. I say, right, what's in excess, copper or sulfur? So I put in 80, and I try to find the amount of sulfur. And if I come up with uh, an amount of sulfur that's lower, then that's the limiting reagent, and it's a very simple test. And I will... I will uh, go through this with you more in class relative to excess and limiting reagent. It's a very difficult aspect of stoichiometric problems, but a very important one. A very important one. Since the ratio of the given mole copper to the mole sulfur was less than the ratio 2 to 1 from the balanced equation, copper should be the limiting reagent. And always remember, it doesn't matter what technique you use, you're going to be using the same calculations, just possibly in a different order. But whatever is most convenient for you to most consistently get the correct answer that's being looked for in the problem. Using a limiting reagent to find the quantity of a product, sam sample problem 8. What is the maximum number of grams of copper 1 sulfide that can be formed when 80 grams of copper reacts with 25 grams of sulfur. This is a fairly straightforward problem because we've already done all the, all the background work and we know that we're going to be using 80 grams of copper to compare to the copper 1 sulfide. Let's review what we have. Limiting reagent 1.25 moles of copper. We've done that. That's from sample problem uh, 12.7 moles of copper 1 sulfide, 159.1 grams of copper 1 sulfide. That's one mole of copper 1 sulfide equals 159.1 grams of copper 1 sulfide. That's the molar mass. And we're looking for the mass of copper 1 sulfide in grams. So we simply say the limiting reagent, which was determined in the previous sample problem, is used to calculate the maximum amount of copper copper 1 sulfide formed. So what the book would want you to do, and what I would do in a different way, is go from moles of copper to moles of copper 1 sulfide to grams of copper 1 sulfide. The equation yields the appropriate mole ratio. One mole of copper 1 sulfide over two moles of copper. So I'm going to take the equation. Two copper plus one sulfur yields one copper 1 sulfide, so I have 128, 32, and 160 as the stoichiometric masses, but I'm going to only compare 2 copper to 1 copper 1 sulfide. So the ratio is, the constant ratio in the next step is going to be 2 copper to 1 copper 1 sulfide equals 128 over 60 equals x over 80. So if 128 copper produces 160 copper 1 sulfide, how much does 80, how much copper 1 sulfide does 80 grams of copper produce? Solve for X, X equals 100 grams of copper 1 sulfide. This technique takes into account all conversions listed in the analysis page. The first thing you start with is a completely balanced formula equation, otherwise known as a stoichiometric equation. Evaluate. Copper is the limiting reagent in this reaction. The maximum number of grams of copper 1 sulfide produced should be more than the amount of copper that initially reacted because copper is combining with 
sulfur. However, the mass of copper 1 sulfide produced should be less than the total mass of the reactants, 105 grams, because sulfur was in excess. I promise this is easier than it looks. I promise. Percent yield. In theory, when a teacher gives an exam to the class, every student should get a grade of 100%. This generally does not occur, as shown in figure 11, approximately on the next slide. Instead, the performance of the class is usually spread over a range of grades. Your exam grade, expressed as a percentage, is a ratio of two items. The first item is the number of questions you answered correctly. The second is the total number of questions. Figure 11, calculating the ratio of the number of correct answers to the number of questions on the exam, is a measure of how well the student performed on the exam. And here is a quick exam sheet uh, for somebody. I don't know. I'm glad it's not me. The grade compares how well you performed with how well you could have performed if you had answered all of the questions correctly. Chemists perform sim similar calculations in the laboratory when the product from a chemical reaction is less than expected. Based on the balanced chemical equation, when an equation is used to calculate the amount of product that will form during the reaction, the calculated value represents the theoretical yield. The theoretical yield is the maximum amount of product that could be formed from given amounts of reactants. In contrast, the amount of product that actually forms when the, equa when the reaction is carried out in the laboratory is called the actual yield. The percent yield is the ratio of the actual yield to the theoretical yield expressed as a percent. Percent yield equals actual yield divided by theoretical yield times 100 because the actual yield of the chemical reaction is often less than the theoretical yield. The percent yield is often less than, usually less than, rarely is equal to 100 percent. So, we know that it's simply going to be actual yield over theoretical yield times 100 is going to equal the percent yield. The percent yield is a measure of the efficiency of the reaction carried out in the laboratory. This is similar to an exam score measuring your efficiency of learning or a batting average measured your efficiency of hitting a baseball. A percent yield should not normally be larger than 100%. It's impossible to be larger than 100%. Many factors cause percent yields to be, to be less than 100%. Reactions do not always go to completion. When this occurs, less than the calculated amount of product is formed. Let me be very clear about something. You will never get 100% yield in a laboratory. It's just impossible. There are, there's bad instruments, there's shoddy workmanship, there's all kinds of things, despite your best efforts, you're not going to come out with 100%. And you would never come out with more than 100%. It would be literally impossible. You're saying that the theoretical yield is wrong, and the theoretical yield is not wrong. Here are some batting averages, uh, how many times you get, get a hit. Not necessarily hit the ball, but it's a measure of hits. And these are some old stats from, from uh, Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth. Impure reactants and competing side reactions may cause unwanted products to form. That's exactly what's going to happen. Actual yield can also be lower than the theoretical yield. It will always be lower than the theoretical yield due to a loss of product during filtration or in transferring between containers. Moreover, if reactants or products have not been carefully measured, a percent yield of 100% is unlikely. An actual yield is an experimental value. Figure 13, approximately on the next slide, shows a typical laboratory procedure for determining the actual yield of a product of a decomposition reaction. It shows 
it shows the actual yield. So here is the chemist determining actual yield. For reactions in which percent yields have been determined, you can calculate and therefore predict an actual yield if the reaction conditions remain the same. Checkpoint. What factors can cause the actual yield to be less than the theoretical yield? And the answer is everything. If something's going to go wrong, it will. It's an Irish philosophy that works very well in chemistry. Trust me, nothing's perfect and it's very frustrating. But it's satisfying to know that you're not alone. Calcium carbonate, which is found in seashells, is decomposed by heating. The balanced equation for this reaction is two calcium carbonates yield one calcium oxide plus carbon dioxide. Now, what is the theoretical yield of calcium oxide if 24.8 grams of calcium carbonate is heated? Now remember, this is seashells. I can tell you right away, you know, if it is seashells, it's going to be a lot of error. But just measurement and just the fact that the balances may not be, may not be good ones. So here's what we know. We know the mass of calcium carbonate, 24.8 grams. We know what a mole of calcium carbonate is, 100.1 grams calcium carbonate. It's the molar mass. We know what the mole, we know one mole of calcium oxide is 56.1 grams. The unknowns is going to be the theoretical yield of calcium oxide. And so, calculate the theoretical yield using the mass of the reactant. So you're going to go mass of calcium carbonate to mole of cal calcium carbonate to mole of calcium oxide to mass of calcium oxide. The appropriate mole ratio is 1 calcium oxide to 1 calcium carbonate. So that kind of simplifies things tremendously. But I, and I'm going to do those specific conversions, but in my own way. It makes things, I don't know, look a little bit easier, and there's more chemistry involved. So, here I have the stoichiometric equation, and I have 100 grams of calcium carbonate. That's what is written there, one mole. One mole of calcium oxide is 56 grams, and one mole of carbon dioxide is 44 grams. So then, I'm comparing calcium carbonate with calcium oxide, so 100 is to 56, as 24.8 is to X. X equals 14 grams of calcium oxide. This, techni this technique takes into account all conversions listed in the analysis page. The first thing you start with is a completely balanced formula equation, otherwise known as a stoichiometric equation. So, the question asks you, to determine the theoretical yield. And we're saying that the theoretical yield rounded to one's place is going to be 14 grams of calcium oxide. The mole ratio of one calcium oxide to one calcium carbonate is one to one. The ratio of their masses is the reaction in the reaction should be the same as the ratio of their molar masses, which is slightly greater than one to two. The result of the calculation shows that the mass of calcium oxide is slightly greater than half the mass of calcium carbonate. Recall the percent yield is calculated by multiplying the ratio of the actual yield to theoretical yield by 100 percent. Therefore you must have values of both the theoretical yield and the actual yield to calculate the percent yield. So where is this heading? I think this is heading for the fact that they're going to give you an actual yield and you're going to compare that to the theoretical yield if that's where I think it's going. So in the original problem we had what is the the calculating the percent of the reaction using calcium carbonate etc. It says what is the percent yield if 13.1 grams of calcium oxide is actually produced when 24.8 grams of calcium carbonate is heated. So what we're going to do is we're going to simply say the 13.1 divided by 24.8 times 100 because that's going to be the, the uh, actual yield divided by the theoretical yield. So the actual yield is 13.1, the theoretical yield is 14, so the actual yield, which is 13.1, 
divided by the theoretical yield, which is 14 times 100, is going to give you the percent yield. So it's no secret. So I'll let you observe this. These are the knowns, don't forget. These are the knowns. We're not through the analysis yet, but these are the knowns. And now let's look at the unknowns. The only real unknown is the, the percent yield. We know the actual yield. We know the theoretical yield. Now we've got to look at the, the percent yield given the actual yield and the theoretical yield. And so the question is, what is the percent yield? And that's actually what we're looking for. So it's no surprise that it's the unknown. So the percent yield equals actual yield over theoretical yield, 13.1 divided by 14 times 100 is 94% yield. May your yields always be that wonderful. Never happen. However, some experiments are routinely, routinely easy to do and you get good values. Other experiments are very difficult. If you're, if you're finding the ratio of zinc to zinc chloride, that's a terrible one to find because zinc chloride is very difficult to handle. In this example, the actual yield is slightly less than the theoretical yield. Therefore, the percent yield should be slightly less than 100. The answer should have three significant figures. Let's conclude this chapter with a little bit more look at, um, at the uh, safety, car safety that they spoke about. Here is the automobile restraint system history. It would, may surprise you. 1947, Tucker Automobile Company makes the safety belts available. Nash Motor Company provides lap safety belts, that's 1949. 1958, Swedish engineer patents chest lap safety belt, 1958. 1963, Volvo makes chest lap safety belt standard equipment on U.S. Uh, models. 1988, Chrysler Motor Company makes airbag restraint safety system standard. However, in my car, we didn't have seat belts as standard equipment until 1967, when I was growing up and we had uh, until then we had cars older cars used cars that were not equipped and I didn't have an airbag until the late 1990s and here is just the right volume of gas in the front end collision proper inflation of an airbag may save your life engineers use stoichiometry to determine the exact quantity of each reactant in the airbags inflation system Interpreting diagrams. What is the source of the gas that fills an airbag? Look at the chemical equation. You're, it's going to produce a gas that's part of the, that's part of the chemical reaction. Here is a horrific picture uh, of a dummy. That's the dummy striking the windshield. So, so the sources of the nitrogen gas are the decomposition reaction of sodium azide and the reaction of sodium with potassium nitrate. So uh, here we have a variety of things you can look at where the airbag is coming out of and the ignition unit, the, the igniter. Let's spend some time, let me change the timings and let's spend some time on this diagram. Okay, you have the crash sensor in the steering column, you have the inflator, you have the airbag, the sodium azide is there, underneath the uh, steering wheel. Again, there's another shot of the crash sensor. You have the nitrogen gas being produced, the airbag, the inflator, the steering wheel, sodium azide pellets are underneath the, or probably inside the airbag. You have the igniter, which comes up to the airbag. Uh, you have the ignition unit. You have the airbag folded into the steering wheel. A collision triggers crash sensors which send a signal to the igniter. When we, when I was an EMT going to crash accidents to care for victims, we have to, the first thing we did was to unhook the battery, cut the cable so that the airbag didn't deploy uh, by accident and it could really cause some serious injury because of how fast it goes. Just the right volume of gas reaction one is going to be uh, sodium azide yield sodium plus nitrogen and then the sodium mixes with the potassium nitrate to produce potassium oxide, sodium oxide and nitrogen and heat. So those are the two reactions that occur in the airbag to produce that amazing quantity of gas. Proper inflation of the airbag requires two reactions. An 
an electrical current produced by the igniter causes the decomposition of sodium azide into sodium metal and nitrogen gas. Note that the sodium metal produced is dangerously reactive. In the second reaction, sodium nitrate reacts with the elemental sodium and forms potassium oxide and sodium oxide and additional nitrogen gas. The heat caused all the solid products to fuse with silicon oxide or simply sand, powdered sand, which is also part of the reaction mis mixture. The fused product is a safe, unreactive glass. It's a safe, unreactive glass, but you're still going to feel maybe some residue of the glass cutting your face or maybe a little sodium metal. It's not a pleasant experience. Uh, the controlled explosion, look how fast that goes. The airbag unfolds and reaches its full size in protective effect within milliseconds of the crash. Within milliseconds of the crash. When life-saving airbags contain hidden defects, they can become lethal weapons. That awful irony is the story behind several tragic deaths and many injuries believed to be caused by certain defective airbags manufactured by Takata Corp, sometimes Takada. In the event of an accident, the faulty airbags may explode, sending shrapnel-like metal fragments into the driver or passenger. It is not a pretty sight, and the injuries have been described as stabbing wounds. Automobile restraint systems statistics, the use of airbag restraint systems, seatbelt airbags reduces the risk of fatality in accidents about 70%. That is an amazing statistics. 70 out of 100 will live another day. There's the explosive, gosh, it's amazing, isn't it? Amazing. 17.1, some car facts. 17.1 million cars and light trucks were sold in 2002 in the United States. Monaco has the highest number of vehicles in relation to its road network. In 1996, most recent figures, it had 480 vehicles for each kilometer of road. If they were, requir if they were required to park behind one another on the streets, half would have nowhere to park. At night, headlights illuminate 160 feet in front of your car. If you are driving 40 miles an hour at night, your reaction distance is 88 feet, and your braking distance is 101 feet. Is your stopping distance less than or greater than 160 feet? Reaction distance equals braking distance equals stopping distance. Are you driving safely. Let's look at the second aspect of airbags. Let's spend some time on this particular slide. So we see number two, the igniter triggers a series of chemical reactions that release a large volume of nitrogen gas which fills the airbag within 0.05 seconds on the collision. The airbag is fully inflated. Sodium azide pellets decomposing. Two nitrogen azide, two moles of nitrogen azide yield two moles of sodium and three moles of nitrogen gas. There's the igniter, electrical signal from crash sensor, and the steering wheel, and the horrific car. Let's take a moment to look at the car. Even though the book doesn't mention it, look at the car. That, that's called a crumple zone. That is actually a safety mechanism. So if it looks crumpled, that's a good thing. Crumple zones are good. Non-crumple zones are bad. So, here we have another one. Steering wheel, deflated airbag after the accident. Small holes in the airbag allow nitrogen gas to escape, causing the bag to deflate. So, there are some pictures of that particular one. Here's a picture of the deflated airbag. Look at the uh, windshield. Uh, look at the, the, the dummies in the car. And you'll find that, uh, you know, those test dummies are pretty amazing things. Uh, so much for animal testing. Thank God we have dummies. Here is a picture of the airbags. Uh, notice the designs. Uh, the steering wheel is round, rounded because it's a steering wheel. 
and the uh, passenger seat. So much for putting your seat back, you would really uh, smack into that airbag quite, quite uh, dramatically. Here are some structural safety enhancements. Uh, you have frontal offset reinforce reinforcements, engine cradle, tunnel reinforcement, structural foam, rocker inner reinforcement, structural foam in rockers, rear rocker reinforcement, a pillar reinforcement. That's the front. That's the yellow. That's the they go like pillars. The front, the front pillar would be A, B, and C in that order. Uh, you have windshield A pillar insert. You have side impact pillar reinforcements, B pillar reinforcements, roof rail in, inserts, side impact door beams. You have the anti lock brake system. You have heated windshield washer system. You have higher capacity brake system. You have rear parking assist. You have side thorax airbag. Isn't that amazing? The side thorax airbag. You have the side curtain airbag. You have the uh, do, driver side dual stage airbag. That's in the gray. You have the passenger side dual depth airbag. That's in the purple. You have the passenger airbag automatic suppression system. That's that's yellow, uh, and that concludes our chapter on stoichiometry. And read it, read it early, listen to it early, and good luck on your test on stoichiometry. It's going to be a little bit of a while away, but don't don't wait. Start right away because chapter nine, ten, eleven, and twelve, it's all related. And if you wait, if you take three weeks completely off, your brain will not be the same. And so you want to, you know, keep a little bit working on your stoichiometry, a little bit each day, will help fortify your understanding of the central concepts in chemistry called moles and stoichiometry. Have a good day and goodbye.